All right, guys, so seemingly every week we come out here and we have to discuss Kamala's new commentary on the issue of Israel and Gaza. And look, the new commentary is the same as the old commentary. Every single time she opens her mouth, she repeats the same lines. She says, look, I'm totally committed to Israel's right to defend themselves. I'm going to make sure they have the ability to defend themselves. But also, October 7th was horrible, but we also desperately need a ceasefire. Too many innocent Palestinians are being killed. And we're going to do everything we can to get a ceasefire and bring about Palestinian self-determination and a two-state solution. This is her her playbook. She goes point for point for point every time she brings it up. And look, I think people are reasonably frustrated with that, myself included, because even when she's asked directly, hey, will you cut off the weapons or threaten to cut off the weapons to Israel because they're killing massive numbers of innocent civilians on a daily basis, would you cut off those weapons? She just goes right back to the same playbook, reads the same talking points off the script, and then moves along, right? So there is a lot to criticize there, a lot. And I've done it myself, and I'll continue to do it because basically what she's saying is, my policy is not going to change from Joe Biden's. It's going to be the same. I'm going to virtue signal about a ceasefire. I'm going to pretend like I'm applying pressure, but ultimately I'm going to keep sending money. I'm going to keep sending weapons, and Netanyahu's going to keep rejecting a ceasefire and fucking over the Palestinians, but also us at the same time in a different way, because this, of course, is part of Netanyahu's grand plan to try to get Trump back in office. And he's playing Joe Biden like a fiddle, right? Um, So it's horrible from a moral perspective, from an ethical perspective, but even from a political perspective to save the Democrats' own ass, you got to cut off the money and the weapons. In October, it's very likely there will be the October surprise of Netanyahu launching an all-out attack on Hezbollah and Lebanon or against Iran, or both drawing the U.S. in, massive regional war before the election, Biden will get the blame, Kamala might as well, helps Trump to get back in office, and we all know Netanyahu wants Trump to get back in office. So you guys know my whole spiel on this whole thing. We've gone through it a million times. But seemingly after every time Kamala has to talk about Israel and Gaza, and she makes her commentary, and does she, she does the both sides thing, On the genocide, right? Oh, you got to see both sides. You know, October 7th is bad. And also a lot of civilians in Palestine being killed is bad. But Trump always comes out within the next day or two. And he's like, no, I will raise the stakes. And I will be way worse than Kamala on this exact issue. So she both sides a genocide. And I'm going to pro-genocide the genocide, right? Like I'll be on the pro-genocide side of the genocide. Okay, so he's talking to Mark Levin. By the way, one of the most humiliating interviews I've ever seen. Mark Levin basically breaks out the hot oil and some stones and gives him a massage and gives him a little happy ending. Gives gives him a little Jack Offington of his little mushroom dick at the end, right? This is what Mark Levin does. Most embarrassing interview I've ever seen. This guy's the biggest pseudo-intellectual on the planet with the most nasally annoying voice I've ever heard. So the issue of Israel comes up. Listen to what Trump says. If you go back 15 years or even less... The strongest lobby, in that sense, in the United States was Israel. You couldn't say a thing about Israel, Christian or Jew. You couldn't say anything about today. It's like under siege. Let's pause here to reflect on this. His point is, you know, it wasn't that long ago Israel and their lobbyists had an ironclad hold on our entire Congress. And you couldn't say anything bad about Israel ever. You couldn't say anything. And now... There's 2% criticism that's coming through against Israel, and frankly, I think that's disgusting. I think Israel's got to go back to having total control of the entire discourse and not allowing anybody to critique Israel at any step of the way. He's bemoaning the idea that the Israel lobby has less power than they did. Which, by the way, is that true? No. Like I said, you get 2% criticism of Israel nowadays, but they're committing a genocide. You should be having way more than 2% criticism. It should be universal. We should have already cut off the money and the weapons and fucking sanctioned them into the high heavens, right? So it's not true that they lost power. But in his mind, he's saying, some people are criticizing Israel. Disgusting. We should go back to when they weren't allowed to criticize Israel because the lobby paid everybody off and then everybody realized I don't say anything bad about Israel. He's saying the quiet part out loud yet again. Yet again. He's bemoaning that there's now some criticism of Israel along the edges. He says they're, quote, under siege. Why? Because people point out the objective reality that they're massacring civilians on a daily basis? You don't even have anybody except maybe Rashida Tlaib and maybe Ilhan Omar that say, cut off the money and the weapons. 
And even that's the duh position. Of course, that's the right thing to do. But, oh my God. All right. So there you go. He's mad that Israel doesn't have as much power as they used to. He's mad about that. He's mad about that. You couldn't say anything about today. It's like under siege. You look at AOC plus three. You look at these people, the way they talk about it. And then you see Schumer, who's become a Palestinian, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, he's actually become like a Hamas agent. Schumer, how did that happen? So the tiniest, slightest criticism of Netanyahu and Israel from a Democratic politician, and this is what he says. You're like a Hamas agent. You're like a Palestinian, which everybody knows is a disgusting, disgusting thing. He can't help himself. Now, by the way, let's get to the most important point here. Why is he taking this stance? Why is he very clearly outflanking the Democrats to their right on the issue of the genocide? Do I even need to say it? You guys know. You guys know the answer. The reason why he was so pro-Israel when he was president is a guy by the name of Sheldon Adelson. He gave Trump's campaign $100 million on two separate occasions. And as a direct result of that, this was reported on. He basically let Sheldon Adelson control U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel in the Middle East. So what did he do? Ripped up the Iran agreement, which was working, by the way. The Iran agreement was working. Ripped it up because Sheldon Adelson and Israel and Netanyahu, they didn't like that agreement. They want war with Iran. They don't want peace. He ripped it up for them. He allowed Israel to illegally annex the Golan Heights, which is Syrian territory. He said, no, it's not. No, I say it's Israeli territory. Greenlit that. Moved the embassy to Jerusalem and did the Abraham Accords, which was the whole point of that was to spit in the eye of Palestinians and say, you don't matter. You don't count. We're going to work around you. We're going to make peace with all the other Arab nations in the region. And we're going to say you can be under permanent occupation and nobody gives a fuck. Sit there and take it. And by the way, that helped lead to Hamas going, oh, really? You're going to work around us and put your middle finger up to us? Watch this. And that's when they did October 7th. So he gave Israel everything they wanted. Now, that was in the first term. Sheldon Adelson now died. But guess what? Miriam Adelson, his wife, is still around. And she promises, Trump, I'll give you $100 million if you allow Israel to annex the West Bank and make that fully Israeli territory. Quid pro quo. Trump's like, cool. So what does Miriam Adelson want? You got to be 100% on the side of the genocide. You got to be with Netanyahu. You got to be with the IDF. You got to overlook the fact or support the fact that Israel is bombing schools and hospitals and UN buildings, and they've destroyed 70% of Gaza, and they're torturing innocent people, including to death by raping them with metal rods. They're doing 42 different kinds of torture at literal concentration camps that they set, that they set up. This is what's going on. And it's, hey, you got to support that. And Trump's like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I'll start using Palestinian as a slur, and I'll start being angry that the Israel lobby is not as strong as they used to be. I want them to control our politics completely. So Donald Trump, don't get it twisted, is an Israeli cuck and a Saudi cuck. And then we got more to add to the list. A cuck to the government of Oman. You'll see that in the second term because he's doing a business deal with Oman. And there's reporting he got $10 million cash from the Egyptian dictator. He's open for business. He's on for business, and this is the result. One more thing I wanted to point out. Trump tweeted, meet your neighbors if Kamala wins, and it's a bunch of Muslims burning an American flag. So he's ushering in the 9-11 uh, era racism is back. 9-11 era Islamophobia, Muslim hatred, it's back. He's bringing it back completely. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop, and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.